welcome to another episode of Disaster Empire Quick Views. This is the podcast where we talk to innovators and thought leaders in resilience. And I have a special treat for all of you out there today. I am talking with Meredith Wilson. So welcome, Meredith. Really great to be talking to you about risk intelligence and resilience. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Ashley. Great. So you head up Emergent Risk International. You are a great person to talk about risk intelligence, and you've been in the business for about 10 years now. So let's dive right in, because this is a hot topic, as you know, (laughs) and ever expanding. Tell the audience, why is a geopolitical risk understanding really vital for companies in today's world. And along with that, can you share some strategic insights? As far as uh, risk intelligence goes, and, and I would actually broaden it beyond geopolitical, I think sometimes we get really focused in that little geopolitical spot, but mm-hmm. it's actually much broader than that. It's uh, it's everything from ESG to security to geopolitical to um, hurricanes. It, it doesn't really matter, right? It's It's really risk intelligence about everything that, um, you know, that could befall a a company. Pandemics, right? We had, you know, we had pandemics broadly on the radar, but it really still took everybody by surprise how quickly we, you know, we kind of, the entire world's come to a pandemic in 2020. So it's really broader than that. It's really having the, you know, the forward insight to understand what might be coming and also to be able to, to create the resilience through knowledge that helps you build those resources that you need when something happens. And it's not prediction, right? It's not, my job is not, and I tell people this all the time, my job is not to predict the future. My job is to give you some ideas of what is realistically possible and for you to be able to then take that and pivot as you need to, to react with the right resources. Not a crystal ball, unfortunately. (laughs) It's not. Yeah, it's not. And it shouldn't be right. And the last thing, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I'm in risk intelligence and X, Y and Z are going to happen. What happens when they're wrong and you put all of your you put all of your resources into planning for this one thing to happen and they turn out to be wrong? Right. That's not what it's about. It's it's really about understanding the possibilities. So let's talk about what are the keys to success? What should companies be looking at and trying to understand? Maybe it would be helpful if you could start with your definition of risk intelligence. So when I look at risk intelligence, and and, and my company is very specific to risk intelligence in a business context. We also work with NGOs and, and some government agencies, but our real bread and butter is business risk intelligence. And I preface my definition of risk intelligence with that because I want to be very specific when I say when we think about risk intelligence, it's really that vetted, high quality, targeted information and that information that is only valuable if you understand the context in which you're putting it. And so any type of vetted information that furthers the mission of your organization, right? So I could be giving uh, risk intelligence to a tech company that's completely useless to an ag company, right? And so the real, you know, the really important piece of that is that that intelligence, that information actually helps a decision maker do their job better, right? Helps them make a better decision, a more informed decision that then helps build, you know, whatever the the mission of the business is. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I think that's such a great point is that it can be very specific depending on what part of our industry that you're in. And I think that What makes a partnership with companies like yours so important is to really be learning from your expertise. Obviously, every company needs to know itself and and what its risks are, but really getting that perspective. And I think that's the value of partnering with an organization like yours. And so let's let's talk about and shift gears just a little bit till we talk more about this. But this is something that I ask all of my guests because this podcast is all about resilience. So what does it mean to you? You know, for me, the whole idea of resilience, and we spend a lot of time, in fact, we we talk a lot about, you know, the mission of our company is really 
to help build resilience in companies. And it really doesn't matter. I think we, you know, we traditionally started in that security space, but really it doesn't matter if you're security, if you are um, working directly in the business, if you are an operations manager, or if you're a crisis manager, resilience is really about that ability to pivot and adapt and react in a way that is, you know, that is going to, at the end of the day, keep the company safe, keep your employees safe and continue to protect the business. And so that means if there's a pandemic, your ability to pivot to manage that crisis versus if there's a hurricane or (laughs) they're both happening at the same time, right? You've got to have the ability to manage whatever comes your way. It can't just be, oh, we didn't plan for this scenario, so what do we do now, right? And so in building resilience, one of the biggest um, important things is that knowledge of what could happen, but also that you've thought through those scenarios and you've thought through ways to react. It doesn't mean it's, as I'm sure you know, right, that we follow exactly the crisis plan one by one, right? Because it may turn out that that crisis plan doesn't work, right? But the ability to say, (laughs) right, exactly, right? Okay, this isn't going to work in this particular scenario. So how do we work, right? I think we we all got a a pretty strong lesson in that, um, you know, back at the uh, back in the early days of the pandemic. Right. We're going to figure this out. We're going to make it work because we don't have a choice. Really taking that theme of resilience and from your perspective, how can companies better boost their resilience in this space by partnering or by really understanding and and delving into risk intelligence? Yeah, that's a really good question. It kind of takes me back to the earlier question that you didn't ask to about sort of the key, or sorry, that I didn't answer, you asked, I didn't answer, which was kind of the key to success. But, you know, there is, um, you know, what we have right now, it used to be, you know, back in the day when we, when even when I moved from government to private sector, I've actually been in the space about 20 years and the company is about 10 years old. And when I moved from government to private sector, we didn't have enough information sources, right? We did, you know, the internet was still relatively yeah. new. Twitter was amazing. It was like a gold mine at the time, but, but, but now we have this massive information coming at us all the time. We are bombarded with information. And so anybody can tell you that they do risk intelligence. Anybody can tell you that they're going to give you intelligence. The problem is more around how you classify the information and how you apply that information. But first and foremost, how you vet that information. And one of the big problems that we have right now is that the information environment is what, uh, you know, some of my colleagues like to call polluted. There's a lot of really bad information out there. And there's a lot of information that is designed to get your attention, but is actually not that important. So um, we spent a lot of years reacting to terrorism writ large in this country. And and don't get me wrong, um, post 9-11, there's a, a really good reason why we did. But we missed some other really big stuff in the process, right? There were all kinds of things developing under the surface where people were not paying attention because they were so, they're focus was so trained on big headlines about terrorism, things like disinformation, right? And so we have this whole disinformation problem that's bubbled up over the last five or six years, but it's actually been going on for 10 or 15, where people just were not aware of what was happening, the way that information was being manipulated. And so when we think about intelligence, it's kind of the same thing. Is your intelligence provider actually providing you information that helps you make decisions or are they just providing you big, sexy headlines and, and it's interesting and exciting to you, so you're buying it? And, and that is a, you know, that's that's only one of, of a number of, of things that you need to be looking for. But really looking at, does this intelligence provider, this person, the information they're providing, is it actually providing value to anybody outside of my immediate group? So you have this, you know, security group, for example. They're used to getting information in the government that is, you know, is focused focused on national security, focused on terrorism, all of these kinds of things, they go over to the private sector and they still want that kind of information. But once they send that outside of their group, the business is looking at it going, why why are you giving me this, right? I don't understand why this is relevant to me. So is that information actually relevant to your business? And sometimes um, that requires the the person who's buying the information to go and do their own homework. Do I understand enough about my business to know 
what kind of information they need. Do I understand enough about our risk risk exposure, right? Have I talked to the Ashley Guzmans of the world? Have I found out what the crisis manager is worried about? Or am I sending things saying this is going to be a crisis and the crisis manager is going, eh, actually, no, um, but there is a hurricane coming in in three days and I'd really like some information about that, right? right. So is that information actually hitting the mark for your consumers? Are you actually talking to them enough to know what they need? Your operations manager, you know, they might be they might be worried about, you know, something big and sexy, but there's a good chance that they're actually worried about just getting their permits through because the government that they're working with and, you know, in some African country is just holding on those permits waiting for, you know, who knows what. Right. So there's all kinds of problems in business that intelligence can solve, but it requires the person who's providing that information to know enough about the business to be able to provide that out. That's a key point that you're making and such an important distinction, because I think like you're saying, one, we can be myopic and just having a very narrow view of what risk could be for an yeah. organization or for the world at large and really needing to try to kind of keep that open net, so to speak. But mm -hmm. then, to your point, being able to hone in and have that critical thinking aspect. And I don't think tools like AI are there quite yet, right, to take over Not that quite. human aspect of really being able to look at the information and then dive down and say, well, this is really concerning for us or it's yeah. not, and we don't have to pay as much attention to it. It really can stay on the peripheral. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Yeah, and, and AI is one of those things, you know, we're spending an awful lot of time right now at our company really diving into what is happening with AI and how it's changing the information environment. Because again, you know, there is... There's a lot of promise in these tools. There's a lot of, you know, a potential ability to really speed up processes, save some money because, um, you know, you can give some of your human, you know, some of your human labor back some of their time. But there's also a whole subset of, of people out there kind of looking at this as the way to eliminate a whole bunch of positions. And, and that may or may not be true, but I can tell you right now that most of the tools out there are not ready for that yet. You know, they're not, they're definitely not ready to be your intelligence analyst. They, uh, we've already found ways for them to assist our intelligence analysts though, right? In like doing PowerPoint for example, PowerPoints can suck up three, four days sometimes when you're trying to put together a presentation. And there are some really promising tools out there that might actually speed that up. That would be brilliant to give my analysts more time to read and write and less time spent, you know, cutting and pasting and moving things around on a slide, right? The information tools are really interesting. There's some really fascinating stuff out there. But so far, they're also really good at not telling the truth <laughs> and, and, and really good at covering that up, which when you talked about critical thinking, that's one of those things where I'm like, yeah, we got to talk about that because they, you know, I, as I was putting together this AI presentation for as is, I was kind of testing this theory out again, and you can still get it to give you citations for articles that don't exist. So, you you know, if you don't have the critical thinking skills or the, um, you know, if, if you're just being lazy and not vetting what's coming through there, you're very likely to hand people things that are just flat out not true. So they're dangerous as well as really, really promising. Yeah, I think that's a great distinction is right now my feeling on is you still have to have the base knowledge and being able to vet it if you're mm -hmm. going to use it versus relying on it to kind of fill in the gaps for something that you yeah. don't know. So. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I think that's an important aspect of it. But I agree with you. A lot of promising aspects of, I think, particularly taking away some of the more manual tasks or exactly. automating, right? Some of those tasks that we can't mm -hmm. do today. Like you said, yeah. yeah, I'd love an AI that could design PowerPoint slides for me. That would be great. <laughs> mm -hmm. But hey, along with that, while we have you, what are some of the other trends that you're seeing right now in risk intelligence? There is a, the space is quite crowded at the moment, which, um, you know, is on the one hand really exciting because whenever you have that much competition, you do have like new ideas coming out and new innovations coming out and things like that. But on the other hand, can also kind of lead to this sort of, information overload, you know, both for the people that you're working with, as well as just people kind of bombarding you all the time with, you know, with new ideas and things. But there is, you know, I think most people are really focused on what what AI is doing and what it can do. This is probably the first time I've seen a major technology change where 
I would say most people are kind of paying attention, at least in our space, right? People are really kind of looking at this going, right, what does this mean for us? How do we, you know, how do we take the tools and platforms that we have and evolve them? And so I think that's really, that's one of the big things right now. But but the other thing that, you know, that I'm really hoping for is a little bit more innovation inside of companies themselves where they have these risk intelligence functions. There's a few companies that are really good at it, you know, that have got really innovative leaders and their risk intelligence functions. But there is still a lot of let's do this the way we did it in government, you know, and just tweak it a little bit. But let's write long papers and all of that kind Mm -hmm. of stuff. And there are times where you need the long papers, like say you're doing a, a new market entry, you know, and you really need to assess everything, you know, all the different risks. And that can be a, you know, a five to 10 page paper. But there are so many different ways to communicate intelligence now, and not everybody is willing to look at a paper all day long, you know, is willing to actually take the time to read something, right? So, you know, how can we innovate the products that we're putting out? How can we, um, you know, how can we do things internally in a way that people are used to communicating? Can we do intelligence through our Slack channels? Can we do it through our Teams channels? You know, can we do recordings instead of, um, you know, instead of written briefings? Things like that, um, you know, where that type of innovation will get those products to the consumers so that they hear what they need to hear rather than just kind of shoving something at them that they choose not to read because they've got a million other things to read, right? So I'd like to see a lot more innovation inside of companies as well as in the vendor space where I work, which is where you tend to see the most innovation because there's just, um, there's a business need for it, right? We have the the innovator die sort of motto, you know, you don't really have a choice if you want to keep up in a, in a um, kind of in an environment that we're in right now. I totally agree with that. And I think you hit on it earlier. I think it's so important for those who are working in risk intelligence within an organization to really learn or understand so they can understand their business so that yeah. they're better able to pinpoint the risk to that particular organization. And yeah. I think that sometimes maybe the miss in relying on some tools just to give you everything because they're going to give you kind of the global right overview. Exactly. And I think it's much harder than to choose, okay, what's really going to be impactful to my For business us. or the business exactly. that I'm working with. So I think yeah, that's a great there, point. You know, yeah. And I can't, you know, I, I can't emphasize that point strongly enough, you know, as a provider, we try really hard to, you know, make sure we hit on something that's important to all of our clients every day, but we provide Intel for hundreds of companies every day. And so there is a limit, you know, we kind of focus sector to sector. And even though our employees are required to learn about every single company that we work for, we literally, they literally have to read through their annual reports and all of that. There's a, you know, there's a limitation. And so when we, um, even when we're teaching Intel and when we're working with companies, we're always telling them, make sure that you don't just take that in and cut and paste it, but that you actually contextualize it, right? Because that is your job when you're when you're sitting in the seat in the company is to take all that information and contextualize it to your very specific context. Because it is going to be completely different for an insurance company than it is for a, you know, for an electricity company, right? You're going to have a completely different set of needs there. And while some of the information may match up because, you know, you may be talking about a, a mass shooting or something like that, the actual ins and outs of how that affects your organization is going to be different every single time. Thank you for those insights. Now, I'm sure that you'd love our audience to work with you, but just wanted to pick your brain. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just what would you suggest to organizations, to practitioners who are out there looking to work with a vendor? What do you Mm -hmm. suggest that they should be looking for? Yeah. You know, I, of course, would love everybody to work with us, but I also know that not every intelligence company fits with every, you know, every company's needs. You know, we, for example, tend to work with really strategic industries. So industries that know they're going to go, you know, maybe work in a country for 25 years, Um, you know, your your energy companies, your uh, mining companies, ag companies, tech, that kind of thing. But, you know, there are some companies that they kind of live and die by what happens every, you know, every single day, and they're very tactically focused. And so they might be looking for a provider that is providing really super 
super specific street to street crime information. They might be looking for very, very specific weather information. So it really boils down to what is most important to your company and is this information provider giving you something of value that you can't get elsewhere or that you can't get quickly elsewhere, right? And uh, that's kind of the first thing is, are they, a, you know, are they a good fit for our risk tolerance? Are they a good fit for the information we need every day? The next thing, but but probably the most important is, are they giving you verified information? Do they have a process for vetting their information? What is that process? Make sure that you're, you know, that you're actually asking these questions before you decide to go with a provider, because anybody can write you a report that looks super interesting. Not everybody's going to give you a report that's accurate. And so making sure that, you know, that it's accurate, will they tell you where they source their information from? There was a period of time where a lot of the the big vendors didn't want to tell you where their information came from because they wanted you to think it was coming from super secret sources. There's no need for that. 90 to 95% of the information that most providers give you is coming from somewhere on the internet. You know, there is absolutely going to be some, you know, some human sources that they might be reaching out to. But 95% of the time, especially the stuff that comes out in their daily product, it's based on events driven and it's, you know, it's based on what's happened overnight. So where are they getting that information? Where are they vetting it? How many sources are they looking at? Are they looking at super local sources or are they really focused on those, you know, kind of like New York Times of the world? All of those kinds of things to help them better gauge whether this information provider is really providing good, high quality vetted information, right? Those two things, I think, from an information perspective are, are super important. I think the last thing is ethics. You know, is this an ethical information provider? Are they above board? Are they, you know, are they are they doing the right things and are they not doing the wrong things to get information? And there are, you know, there are information providers out there that might be pulling their information from sources they shouldn't be. So, you know, there's without getting, you know, without getting too specific, there's a lot of there's a lot of software out there these days that can uh, can do things like tap people's phones and things like that. And there are providers not a lot, but there's a few out there that might be engaging in that type of work. You definitely don't want your company's reputation mixed up with somebody who's doing that kind of work. It's uh, if you can you can read the newspapers and see why. You need to make sure that you know that this is an ethical company that they have ethical guidelines that they follow. If not legal guidelines, um, they do need to be legal as well. It is still a pretty unregulated space, though. So the the ethics becomes extremely important. You know what are their kind of guidelines for their people? What is okay to do? What is not okay to do? All of those kinds of things because it is an unregulated space. It's it's super important to keep that front of mind, because anything that happens, especially if you're working for a large company, that your company's name gets associated with is a potential major reputation risk. And so you want to make sure you don't create risk when you find your risk intelligence providers, as well as mitigating other risks. Ernest, I want to thank you for coming on to the podcast today and sharing all of those insights with this audience But before I let you go, is there anything that you wanted to share that you haven't got a chance to talk about yet? Nothing immediate comes to mind. I mean, I've always got things to talk about, but uh, (laughs) but but nothing immediate comes to mind. Um, I think you uh, I think you asked a lot of the really good questions. Excellent. Hey, is there a fun fact that you'd like to share before we do let you go? Uh, Something maybe the hobby that you do on your off time or something, a book that you've read or something interesting just to share a little Uh, bit more about yourself with the audience. No, my fun fact is that I used to uh, up until I moved up here to Rhode Island, we used to have about 50 peacocks that wandered around our neighborhood. And um, it was my favorite thing about living in the neighborhood. But they were also very noisy. (laughs) But uh, yeah, no, I have a few of them. Um, but but that's the one that comes to mind. <laughs> Thank Tell you for that. Later. And again, <laughs> really enjoyed having you on the podcast and hopefully we'll be talking to you again soon. Absolutely. Have a great day. Thank you, Ashley.